is our second uh, press conference of the uh, of this uh, summer meeting, um, and it deals with uh, exotic items, black holes and pulsars. We have two results to report today. One about uh, reassessment of uh, some of the parameters on black holes, and another one on a reassessment of some of the parameters of pulsars. Um, so uh, I will uh, just introduce the uh, the, uh, the speakers. Um, if you have any questions, hold them until the end, and I will try to recognize each of you uh, in turn. And I'll, we'll also take questions from the people who are listening over and the And then Bulan Kiseltan uh, from University of California at Santa Cruz uh, is going to speak um, on a reassessment of the ages of uh, millisecond pulsars. All questions uh, till the end for both uh, uh, for both of our speakers, and our second speaker will be Bulan Kiseltan, about who will speak about uh, pulsars, millisecond pulsars. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Today I will be briefly talking about ages of pulsars and how we utilized what we know about binary evolution and physics to further refine our understanding of uh, pulsar evolution in general. After I put the problem at hand into proper context, I will then touch upon the contributions uh, that this approach offers to millisecond pulsar evolution. How do we solve the big chain jigsaw puzzle that stellar evolution is? On uh, one end, we have a molecular cloud collapsing under its own gravity until it reaches the pressure where it ignites hydrogen and it turns into a star like our own sun. At the point after which it consumes considerable amount of its hydrogen, it will start to fuse helium, carbon, and other elements, uh, which will cause the star to expand. At the point where the balancing outward pressure, which was provided by uh, nuclear fusion, cannot overcome the inward pulling gravitational force anymore, it will eventually implode into either a black hole collapsing into a singularity or a neutron star, which is typically the size of Manhattan Island or into a white dwarf, which is typically the size of Earth. A neutron star, though, is much more than just the end product of advanced stellar evolution. It provides us with the most extreme environment in principle where we can test physical laws unlike any terrestrial laboratory. It's arguably the most exotic environment in the cosmos. And here you see the lighthouse model, those neutron stars we call pulsars. We had more than 40 years to study these objects. The pulses turn out to be incredibly regular. A Mercury atomic clock, for instance, shifts one second of about three to 400 million years, whereas the signal from a typical millisecond pulsar shifts only one millisecond per three billion years. If you do the math right, a typical millisecond pulsar is about 10,000 times more accurate than the best atomic clock we have. These pulses are essentially the only observable we have to study uh, the majority of pulsars. And the uh, task at hand is nothing short of trying to predict the age of a person by just having access to the uh, heartbeat profile. So let's see if we're doing a better job than cardiologists mm -hmm. do. Uh, we'd like to quantify pulsar evolution in what we call the period spin down diagram or the PP dot diagram. You'll see this very uh, frequently in pulsar papers. Here the horizontal line corresponds to how fast the pulsar beats and the vertical line uh, shows the rate at which it slows down. Uh, yes, the billion, billion years, years line here is approximately the age of the galaxy. So in principle, we shouldn't expect any uh, millisecond pulsars below this, what we call the Hubble line. So here we have the blue and red dots which correspond to the observed radio pulsars. As you can see we have quite a number of millisecond radio pulsars which have apparent ages much older than the galaxy that they reside in. So the question then is whether we can do a better job in understanding millisecond pulsar evolution in general. And the answer is yes we can. Here the model that we propose predicts 30% of the millisecond pulsars to be born below the Hubble line. The millisecond radio pulsars that seem to be the oldest within the population are actually well distributed in terms of the age. And we can use this approach 
not only to estimate the ages, but to do predictions regarding the underlying age distribution, the birth periods, the progenitor accretion rates, the emission mechanism. So the two uh, extra constraints that we bring to the table is from binary evolution, we know that there has to be an upper limit where the millisecond pulsars can be born. This is what we call the spin-up line. We adopt a fiducial limit of one millisecond, which corresponds to the green line. And if we properly implement those two limits with what we already know. We see that we can reconcile for the millisecond radio pulsars that appear to be uh, older than the age of the galaxy of and predictions for the uh, global population of millisecond pulsars. So in other words, we believe we now have the machinery by which we can not only take one step, but several steps forward to solve the jigsaw puzzle at hand. Yeah. And I have the tendency to uh, go backwards, go through the edges. So I'll start with neutron stars. Come In the limited time, I couldn't go into the technicality. Please, Please stop by if you have any questions. Thank you. Do we have some questions for any of our speakers? Yes. Um, for Buland, I just wondered if you could actually explain a little bit say, about some of the features that of the pulsars that you use to get a better age estimate. So the effect is not monotonic. It doesn't necessarily predict much older or much younger pulsars. It depends on the particulars of the pulsar. We have a significant number of older looking pulsars that are in fact much younger. And we have young looking pulsars that are in fact much older. If we don't have a good estimate on the distance and the transverse velocity that we need to make the correction for, it's essentially the train whistle effect. We always get a higher pitch as it approaches and the pitch corresponds to the spin down rate. So what we observe is essentially more than what it is and we need to correct for this effect. Thank you, Ron. MSNBC. I think Ron's question pretty much anticipated mine is just uh, more of a layman's explanation for the sorts of factors. It sounds as if the, uh, the corrections that you're introducing have to do more with measurements that have been taken of these pulsars and you, you look at things that would force you to tweak those measurements in yes. order to... So, so tweaking the measurements is only one part of it. And the, the other two parts is you have to implement what we know from binary evolution and limiting physics. So those are theoretical tweaks that we need to introduce to the measurements in order to predict uh, an age that is closer to the true age of the millisecond pulsar, in fact. Steve Marin. I, uh, I'll just make a, a small comment really for the reporters about what Carl presented. They have a question for Bullen, and that is, I think it was a year ago, we met in Austin, that was a year and a half ago, that was a much larger meeting than the January meeting, and we had a busload of reporters on a press tour, and they wanted to know why are we going to a supercomputer? Well, the reason was they were very excited about their new supercomputer, which now did this wonderful work, and so we saw that because we could not get a press tour to their observatory because it's Texas. <laughs> the observatory is a six-hour ride or something. So it's great to see uh, uh, that what they were right. they were telling us how many cycles it had right. and so on, that it's really paying off for science. Then my question for Bullen, just a, a very simple one also. Um, I guess the millisecond pulsars are just like a regular pulsar powered by rotational uh, energy that's in them. Do yes. they ever fade away? They should be around for a very long time. Other questions? Okay, we thank our speakers, and if you have any further questions, please ask them. Our next press conference is tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, I believe. Leaving.